So this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday at 1 p.m. And you can also find me on the Conscious Resistance Network and Conscious Resistance YouTube channel. So today we have Suzanne Tarkowski Tempelhoff, who is currently uh, in Ghana, uh, from, but she's originally from Sweden, and she's the founder of BitNation, uh, an awesome uh, challenge or competition to the monopoly of government services that we all experience. <laughs> so Suzanne, tell us a little bit about, uh, maybe let's start with how you became an anarchist. That's, that's always a good way to start. <laughs> Um, well, I always thought about, you know, the limits of the nation state, uh, not from an anarchistic perspective, but just from the fact that I didn't think it made sense to have, uh, you know, not, not competing governance services, just depending on the geographical area you're randomly born in or, or where you happen to live or what passport you happen to have. Um, but I, it wasn't from an anarchist perspective at that time, it was more from a sort of globalization perspective. Uh, but then over time, I became more and more libertarian, sort of, I, I first started reading a bit Austrian economics, and um, I worked for governments for a long time, for seven years, and I started thinking it was really dysfunctional, and I didn't work very well at all, and then I lived in various war zones, where it was quite a lot of anarchy, uh, very little governance like Afghanistan and uh, the rebel controlled territories in Libya during the civil war. And I was really quite impressed, like, over how well society actually functioned with less governance. Um, and then, yeah, so after that, I, you know, I became a minarchist. I think that's the sort of road everybody goes down, you know. <laughs> First you become a minarchist, and then you, like, it gets just sort of harder and harder to defend it, you know, and and then in the end I had to like just come out of the closet, you know, and say, okay, fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> As we all we, we we all run out of excuses, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, so tell me about your um, experience in the Middle East, because I remember hearing through Anarchast you were describing that, and it's really fascinating. Huh? <laughs> I think. Was, yeah. Go, go ahead. Yeah, I spent five years, uh, not only in the Middle East, but also Afghanistan and Pakistan and so forth, which is technically, you know, Central or South Asia. Uh, and then I was in Egypt during the Arab Spring and then Libya during the Arab Spring, which, uh, as we all know, now turned into like a violent civil war, which is still sort of ongoing. Um, and it was a really <clears throat> life-changing experience. Um, the, I mean, on so many levels, really, like seeing on the inside how politics works and how governments work and how people react to things that happen, you know, like when, when people die and like bombs and whatever, like, uh, you know, and living with that sort of tension and yeah. It was uh, it was really funny when I came to Libya. They weren't used to war, and everybody felt like I was sort of like a war psychologist at that point. I was like, "No, this is how you handle this situation. This is how you're supposed to feel in this situation." <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> <laughs> you, see, you see, like you were telling them how to be, how to react, right? <laughs> Well, yeah, because I had been in it for so long, you know, the place, right, for them, they were like, you know, the rebels were like, oh, my God, my brother got shot at the front line. I'm like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> God. <laughs> so, so, and then, and then uh, so it was Libya that was more anarchistic society that you, right, experienced? Um, yeah, in a different way. I mean, Afghanistan is more anarchistic in a way because... They have such a long tradition of regional self-governance. Uh, you know, I mean, they are very governed by like small communities and the tribal structures and so on. Um, I mean, Libya, on the other hand, like infrastructure-wise and everything, in comparison to Afghanistan, it was very well built out because, you know, I mean, it was oil-financed state socialism. So it wasn't, you know wild in the same way, right? Like, uh, like 
I mean, Afghanistan is a little bit Stone Age, you know, in, in that sense. So, but on the other hand, I mean, it was in Afghanistan, there is still a government. It's not a very well functioning one, but there is one. Uh, in Libya, on the other hand, I mean, when I came, there were only like 10 guys uh, who were sitting in a basement, you know, and they were changing the basement every night because uh, they were afraid of snipers. Uh, like, that was rebel government, was probably, and their only job, like, the sole job was to speak to foreign media to get more countries to recognize the rebel territory, right? Mm -hmm. So they had literally no government's job at all. And so it was totally a voluntary society, really. And it functioned really well, you know, like uh, there were like 200 volunteers collecting trash in the streets, engineers working day and night to keep the telephone networks alive. Uh, Boy Scouts doing traffic policing, people paying, you know, with their own money from their own pocket hmm. to buy weapons to fight at the front line. Um, hmm. cool. I mean, really cool. astonishing. Yeah, so it was uh, well, quite quite intense. So, so, you know? so soon after that, you um, you did the the TED talk. No, I did the TED talk. Yeah, yeah. After that, yeah, um, I did that in two thousand twelve. Like uh, late October 2012, so I basically, uh, in October, I signed a book deal to start writing a book about how to start your own nation, the Google Mentor, uh, which I'm still writing, and uh, this is like a never-ending project, right? <laughs> <laughs> never-ending. <laughs> yeah. Um, life, hap yeah. life happens, right? <laughs> no, well, in the end, I, I was like, well... Should I write about it or should I just do it, you know, and write about it after the fact? So mm -hmm. that's when I started with Nation. Uh, so I still think it's better to do it and then write about it rather than the other way around, right? But, but anyways, but yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Time will tell if that was a strategically good move or not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, actions speak louder than words, right? <laughs> I know, right? De definitely. And uh, so, yes, yeah, so, so that month, uh, I signed the book deal, and then uh, I quit. Uh, I stopped working for the government, and I did a TED talk. You know, all like in a matter of like yeah, a couple of days' time, actually. So wow. it was sort of yeah, <laughs> sort of leaving with a bang, you know. And then <laughs> so, so, so you were like a like a, a defense contractor or something like that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, for a few years. Yeah, seven years. Yeah. Wow, and I remember you were commenting how you, you said it, how it, easy it was to make money that way. Um. Well, yeah. No, I mean I don't think it is anymore. You know. Okay. Uh, I mean, when the sort of Afghan and Iraqi wars was really sort of full on, then mm -hmm. yeah. But it's it's like anything. Yeah, you still have to work hard. I mean, if you work hard, you can make it. It doesn't come by itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. There is certainly competition as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it was definitely growth industries for a while there. Um, so, so, I so for wrong reasons, obviously. <laughs> so, so while you were doing that, I assume you didn't consider it immoral. No, I mean, not at all. No, I thought I was like saving the world, you know, because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, because I mean. Terrorism is a big issue. It, I yeah. still think terrorism is a big issue. It's not, you know, just now with Charlie Hebdo, you know, that attack. I mean, I still don't think it's a great thing. You know, I don't, I don't think the, you know, having governments combat it or, or especially not the sort of large scale occupations that, that we have done in the past is the way to go to, to like fight terrorism, right? But, yeah, I mean, it's still an issue. So, but then uh, what I realized over time was that, you know, most of the things we're doing were quite either pointless or directly counterproductive. And, uh, yeah, so yeah, I I, it was demoralizing. <laughs> yeah, it seems like, um, you know, when you talk about terrorism, you have to, it's a matter of perspective, like, you know, I think um, there's a quote, I forgot who said it, that the, the, the terrorists are what the larger armor, army calls the smaller army. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Then, when in fact, you know, like for example, us now in our, you know, occupations in, in the Middle East, especially, you know, arguably we are the terrorists, right? <laughs> Well, I, I think it depends on, well, the definition of terrorism is targeting, uh, the I mean, deliberate targeting of civilians um, with arms. I mean, to, you know, obviously, uh, we have killed a lot more civilians, like we, the Western countries, have killed a lot more civilians than terrorists, have, you know, statistically. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> But it's but I mean it's still not like I mean the US military won't go and like blow up a town square deliberately just to send a message, you know. Mm -hmm. It may accidentally bomb a wedding because they think there are like military targets in that wedding, but it's not it's so correct. technically if you want a definition correct, actually it's not terrorism though uh -huh. <laughs> but yeah, obviously it's worse. You know, anyways, but <laughs> it's not they're not deaths when they're uh, accidental, they're just co collateral damage, right? Yeah, they're collateral damage. <laughs> I mean, they actually are, you know, it's I, I don't think, uh, I mean, we're sure it's not, uh, maybe there are some like insane people in the military who have deliberately targeted civilians at times, but it's certainly, I mean targeting um, uh, military targets is certainly the main point of it. But then, like, who do we know who is a military target? Though? That's when it becomes tricky because, mm -hmm. I mean, that's what I found one of the most difficult things I found in Afghanistan, which was sort of which disgusted me the most uh, about the whole thing, is that I think a lot of people who got targeted uh, um, you know, the intelligence collection wasn't very good, you know, and a lot of people who got targeted, I don't think they were terrorists. They were like conservative Pashtuns who were, you know, against the occupation, but they weren't yeah. terrorists, you know. They wouldn't blow anyone up, right, or, yeah, 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 yeah. or participate in, in that sort of activities. Um, you know, it would be like if, you know, like the Ron Paul movie, Ron Paul did like a campaign movie once, you know, saying like, well, what if, you know, Chinese troops occupied Texas, uh, you know, and people started killing sort of like Tea Party Republicans just because they are like nationalists or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or not even nationalists, that's not even the right word, but like regionalists, let's say. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so... Exactly. Or, or, or let's say Russia, if, if Russia placed, you know, uh, bases, you know, in Mexico and Canada... You know how would how would Obama react, <laughs> right? Yeah, I don't know. Right? <laughs> you know, it's like I think I saw this one meme on Facebook. Uh, it's like you see you see all the bases around around Russia. You know, like in, you know, I guess in the uh, Middle East and then Central Asia and all that. And then they're like they're like those damn Russians. They keep putting their country next to our bases. <laughs> You know, That's so true. Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, it's, it's kind of ridiculous. You know, it's like um, people constantly excuse the um, imperialism that we've grown up with because everybody's just used to it. You know, of course we have occupations. That's what the United States do does. When they occupy <laughs> other countries, right? That's our job. <laughs> that is very sad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but but I mean, it's so uh, like the science of Pentagon alone. It's so incredibly bloated. I mean, the U.S. administration at large, but Pentagon particularly, is. I mean, if you just look at like the number of people who have like secret clearances, there are millions. You know, it's like. Yeah. It's yeah. it's completely it's just pure insanity. It's, oh yeah. Yeah, there was this conservative writer Mark Steiner who wrote an excellent. Article and you know, sort of neoconservative who is not libertarian, you know, like uh -huh. neocon actually. And he still wrote like the U.S. military is too big to you know bi too big to win, you know, instead of like too big to fail. It's an excellent <laughs> piece. <laughs> too big to win. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. You, you, you know, a country. Uh, you know, I always thought a country is only as powerful as the um, you know the. The police officers who are willing to, you know, 
be in the uniform and and hold the guns and the and the military soldiers who are willing to you know go off and uh subjugate and dominate other people right that's <laughs> because without them right the government is nothing right we are they are right. the, it's the people who enforces it yeah yeah the obedient enforces so so tell me about your your ted talk well, what did you uh what was the subject of it like what did you discuss um, well, basically, what Bit Nation is about, you know, like why, uh, so the name of it is to be governed by TED. Uh, and so my whole point is that, you know, we take for granted that everybody, that we need consensus or that we need to democratically vote on things, that everybody in a certain geographical area needs to agree on some things. But that would be like saying, oh, we all need to agree on like what we eat. Like, no, why would we? If I want pasta and you want a hamburger, like, why, why shouldn't we individually decide, right? <laughs> like, exactly. Why, why should like the majority vote on what's for dinner, right? It's, mm -hmm. uh, so there is absolutely no reason for that. Um, and the excuses is, of course, uh, the country, but that's a very bad excuse because the country will go away regardless. Right, because just because of globalization and global migration and global communication, and I mean that's just a fact. And the world is becoming even more interconnected. So now we're even less, you know, close to you know more of the values of people next to us geographically, physically. You know, like two of us are talking now. Like I'm in Africa, um, you're in yes, and we are both friends and united because we share the same values about anarchy and, uh, you know, crypto and all of those things. And so I like, I'm much closer to you than I am to like people who have I've known for years who maybe grew up in the same neighborhood as me, right? Because we have nothing in common really. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's absurd to think that that people's choices should be defined by their geography, right? So, so the point of the talk was that, um, you know, everybody should just start their own government, you know, their own nation. And, <laughs> and we should just have a million of competing nations. So, and if you don't want any, you know, you just opt out altogether. So, no, so, so, that's, so, so, so you're saying there's no, there's no social contract, right? <laughs> Oh God, social contract. <laughs> uh, that's like the most horrible thing. Whenever you talk to your citizens, they're, like, uh, they're like, but it's the social contract. And then the next one, oh, but democracy. We have a democracy. We have power. It's like, no. <laughs> you, have, you, you can push a button, right? That's about it. Yeah. <laughs> After the button is pushed, you have no power whatsoever. <laughs> I know, right? You know, but... uh, I've been talking a lot at like students for liberty and, and places like that uh, over the last two years. And whenever I say like democracies are scam, you know, everybody's like applauding. <laughs> it's so, <laughs> <refreshing to see. laughs> so 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 are they um, the anarchists or just libertarians or what would you say? It really depends, you know. Uh, it depends on the country. Okay. Um, they are. I would say maybe. 30% anarchists mostly, around 20-30%, and others are anarchists, and but, some but are they're just open, like... They're open-minded, though, so they're probably on the, on, their path, on the path, right, towards... That's what I like to think, yeah. yeah. There are some people who are more conservative, I don't know, like, more sort of neocon conservative, like, like, for instance, I was speaking at one in Sweden, and, uh, because it's such a small country, it's only 9 million people, and like the whole like right wing libertarian and then anarchist movements, sort of people who are against uh, and the pirate movement as well, sort of is basically one movement with the same people because you know mm -hmm. the yeah people who are into politics and who are you know, somewhat in those circles, all know each other and hang out, right? Yeah, because, yeah, yeah. Uh, like, in, in yes, it's very divided. Like, you know, yeah, it's very much like here are the neocons and they hate the libertarians and the libertarians, like, <laughs> you know, hate the sort of 
social libertarians or mm-hmm. you know liberal libertarians and yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever like it's because you have 320 million people you know so it's easier to find uh, yeah yeah i mean it's 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 really uh amazing how confusing and complicated it can get with these um hyphens and uh you know, yeah. descriptions, you know, conservative, liberal, democrat, independent, you know, green party, constitution party, right? And, I know. And I think the, the um, you know, if you can simplify your principles as much as possible, then uh, I think you have a better way of explaining your ideas, right? So, you know, do you think it's okay to initiate force against other people, <clears throat> right? Do you, yeah. Right? <laughs> Basically is what it is. Are you willing to leave people alone? <laughs> what yeah, that, that's a, that's. I think that's basically what it comes down to, right? And uh, if you're not, if you're like, if you say, you know, I can live my life, but that guy down the street, he can't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then, then uh, you're basically, <clears throat> what's wrong with society? <laughs> you know. But it's it's so funny when you say that. Like, if if I just ask that question to anyone, they will say no. I'm not ready to initiate force, you know. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, so are you willing to pay other people to initiate force on your behalf? Like, a, exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, like hire a thug to go and beat someone up. That, that's when it gets co- confusing. Oh, well, then it's okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. <exactly. laughs> if 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 it's the hitman that's killing the guy, <laughs> then it's not murder. <laughs> right. And what if that person stole? The money to finance it from others. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah and then they are like, <laughs> it doesn't like really resonate. It's sort of like. Yeah, I have, I have a friend. But that's not what the government is because democracy, you know? <laughs> yeah, because, because democracy. Yeah, I have a, uh, I have a friend. Uh, oh, you don't understand. You don't understand, Suzanne. Yeah. <laughs> or, 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 or you know what I get a lot? I get a, um, you're overgeneralizing, you know, you're over, <laughs> oversimplifying things, you know? You're not considering the big picture. <laughs> oh, um, what? <laughs> no, that's exactly what we are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but, but yeah, I have a friend, and uh, he, uh, he basically argues that taxation is not theft because uh, you have, by, by not leaving, you have chosen to stay here and therefore abide by all the laws and regulations and rules in the country. And well, that's assuming you can leave. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so, yes, yeah, so it's assuming you can leave, you know, um, you have the means to leave because it's expensive and it's very, it's very lengthy, the process of expatriation, as well, yeah. as, well as the fact that they, there really aren't any, um, I guess, industrialized stateless societies <laughs> that we can go to. Um, but, but then again, another... Yeah, and, and then, then as well, I mean... As Americans, they still have like a relatively good passport. What if you are like you're born with a shit passport in like Central African Republic? Like, forget about leaving. You wouldn't even be taken to to like Nigeria as a refugee. You know, even Nigeria would kick you out. Really? Right? Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I mean, if you are born in a Congo or something, you are stuck. And mm-hmm. um, I mean, we're talking about billions of people who who technically could not leave to basically any other country, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, it, you know, unless they live as like you know, hidden in a basement or something, or, or in a you know, in a tent, like yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And and on top of that, you know, there are like linguistic problems. You have to leave your family. You have to learn a new language. Mm-hmm. Whatever. Like, uh, why would you want to do that? And then if you want to exit all together, technically, the only place you can go where that is not currently occupied by a government. Would be Antarctica. <laughs> <laughs> that is certainly not a very attractive option, you know. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, and yet, and the other thing is that um, you know by saying if you stay here, you are implicitly uh, agreeing to the rules and regulations, and uh, you know in the country, you're implying that the U.S. government owns the piece of dirt called the United States, right? Whereas they don't own it because, you know, if you were to, you know, if you were to have ownership of anything, right, you know, you have to um, make, basically make good use of it, you know, you, you know, if you, if you own land, the, the best way to confer ownership is to use the land in some um, useful way, perhaps to, you know, make a house for yourself or make products that you, other people would want to buy, right? So in that sense, 
how can the U.S. the federal government own <laughs> the entire you know area known as the United States? You know, it claims dominion because it has all the guns, right? But that's about it. <laughs> There's no ownership. Yeah, exactly. And, and then people say, "Oh, we need government to like defend property rights, to defend our property." Like, if the government can come and take away your property by violence, uh, yeah, no, then you don't own your property. Then you don't believe in property rights, right? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, the government is the primary. The violator yeah. of, of property rights, right? Just just by virtue of taxation alone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the thing. You know, so. I don't. I can't say how you, you can say that you know that you believe in property rights and you think property rights is a good thing. Yeah. And then um, also, not be an anarchist. Like yeah. that does. In, in order to prevent somebody from um, from robbing you, assaulting you raping you or killing you, we have to have a government in place that robs, assault, rapes, and kills you. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> we should, we should get, we should, we'll take care of that for you. Don't worry. Don't, don't worry about it. Exactly. It's complete insanity. So, so, so tell, tell, uh, tell me about uh, BitNation and how that came out and what it is. Um, well, basically, it's the same idea as what I'm writing my book on and what I did a TED Talk on. So basically, um, competitive, non-nation state based, uh, non-geographically based governments. So, so, you know, you can think about it a little bit like just as easy as you choose between using Facebook or LinkedIn or, you know, any other social platform, let's say Reddit or whatever your preference is, uh, you can just choose to do that instantly, right? And and you can choose to use many at the same time or none at all, right? And that's how I want governments. I want it to be as easy and free and voluntary as just signing up on Facebook or signing up for two or whatever. So, and that's sort of, I mean, I, I was writing about it since I was 20 years old, uh, thinking about it and writing about it. Uh, full disclosure, I'm 31 now, so... <laughs> so, so <laughs> What, what? So yeah, for, for more than a decade, um, okay. and then um, I, you know, so as I said, like I signed a book deal to write about it, and I started to travel around in anarchist communities, you know, um, I went to Galskolsh and Chile, I uh, visited the projects in Guatemala and Honduras to build deep zones, uh, I talked to people from the Sea Setting Institute and from like many different sources, you know, I was like tracking all those different projects. And then Bitcoin came along and um, I mean, I discovered Bitcoin in 2012 and I was like, wow, international currency, that's so cool. And then I didn't think that much more about it, you know, other than that it was awesome. But then uh, in 2014, like, I, 2013 and 2014, I started to understand more of the blockchain technology and a lot of new technology started to emerge then, and they're still, I mean, in this very early emerging stage, right? It's like the way there are now meta-to-o protocols where you can create smart contracts on the blockchain, store them on the blockchain, you can create tokens that represent value like a house or like a corporate equity, you can... There are just so many things that are emerging right now, ID systems, everything. And so, because when I thought about BitNation before, I didn't think about that name at the time. I, I thought I would call it the Google Mint. But uh, then I, as I became more and more into like Bitcoin, uh, you know, I became BitNation instead. So... Uh, and then, um, you know, so, so when I initially thought of BitNation, I thought of all these different services, but I didn't, I just thought, you know, we would provide it for other means, right? Like, n not blockchain related, and I thought it would be so exceptionally expensive to do that I would have to borrow like hundreds of millions of dollars from some bank somewhere. Mm -hmm. You know, it would be sort of more as a global insurance company for all those services. But then, you know, I sort of started grasping in 2014. I was like, actually, 
this is all doable, you know, rather inexpensively for the blockchain technology. You can do most of those things. Um, it doesn't have to be that complicated or expensive. And yeah, so then I was just like, well, I should just do it, you know. I've been thinking about it for a decade and yeah. Um, so, so, so do you have a lot of programmers that, that are involved in it and, and help you with that or, or do you do most of the like the, the setup, I guess? <clears throat> uh, well, I, I don't do any programming. I'm not a coder, you know. Uh, I uh, <clears throat> like I organize <clears throat> people and stuff and the ambassador network of course and all the services and you know the financials uh the pr the, all the things so, so you know i i i just have this sort of overarching entrepreneurial role you know everything from making executive decision to cleaning the toilets type of thing you know? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody, somebody's gotta do it right <laughs> right exactly <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, it, it, w w one thing I'm kind of confused because you keep referring to it as a government, right? Um, like, a, I guess, uh, a gov no. a gov that's voluntary, a government that's voluntary, I guess, right? Yeah, I, I think they have to make like a difference between expression, like, it's not a government, it's a governance. Ah, okay, okay. okay. So, yeah. governance can be self governance yes. as well, do self governance. Yeah, yeah. So, that's what we call it, you know, like the, uh, you know, the sort of, Two seconds uh, elevator pitch is uh, <laughs> it's like it's a co collaborative you know platform for do it yourself governance. Cool, very good. Yeah, and that, that and that's really what we do. You know, people, um, you know, once we have finished all the pilots and uh, the apps are put together and stuff, people will just be able to go and like download apps and be like, okay, now I want to title my land. Boom, they download. It. An app, and they do it themselves in like you know an afternoon, or what would otherwise have been done through a government and would have cost like I don't know how much. Um, in many places, it would have taken months, and in some places, be impossible even. So, so for example, the uh, dispute resolution. Um, do you have like a couple of of companies that do that that offer those services? How, how does that work? Um, no, so the way we're going to do it is when you log into the app, um, you know, you have like one place where you can choose your code of law if you want, you know, British common law, Sharia law, whichever, and you can also upload your own code of law if you prefer. And then, so you choose the code of law, and then that's step one, obviously, and then step two is choosing your arbitrator. And it works in the same way, like everybody can just upload as an arbitrator saying, okay, well, you know, I'm a tribal elder from Afghanistan and I can settle dispute concerning cows, you know, in my region. Or I'm a, uh, you know, a case brief lawyer who can settle dispute between lobby firms. Or I'm a, uh, and then people, you know, through the reputation system, people evaluate them, et cetera, and judge them. And they set their own price, naturally. Mm -hmm. And, you know, then you can choose to, apart from arbitration, or you can choose to have your own lawyers, your own representatives, of course, or represent yourself. And, uh, yeah, that's basically it. Really. Cool. So, so how long has it been around, BitNation? Uh, I started it about six months ago. Well, quite exactly six months ago, actually. So how's the, the participation? The people are responding to it pretty well? Yeah. I mean, it's been, like, massively popular, you know. We've been covered, like, everywhere, like, some of our pilots got featured in, like, even the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, mm -hmm. you know, ah, cool. TechCrunch, cool. Wired. Yeah, I mean, it, we've been all over, really. We, I mean, you know, it's a startup, so it's always a bit shaky, and, you know, we had some up, both ups and downs. That's how it is. Mm -hmm. you know, that's how it will be for the first five years. That's, that's just startup life, right? But... Uh, at large, I mean, the response from the public have been overwhelming, mm -hmm. and and it's funny because it's not just from like anarchists and, and libertarians, but also from like, but also from like liberals, sort of pro globalization, open borders, pro migration liberals, like mm -hmm. left wing liberals. <laughs> <laughs> nice. well, whoever you know, whoever you can get, that's great. Yeah, I mean, 
Hopefully. We don't uh, select based on pride, you know. We yeah. just select based on if you're willing to pay for the service or not. So, yeah. <laughs> It's all voluntary. There's no guns involved, right? It's all voluntary. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> You're not throwing somebody into a cage if they don't uh, use your arbiter? You're <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but it's very funny when people are like, okay, but how are you going to settle stuff? Like, uh, you know, if someone do something criminal and don't, um, you know, refuse to go to arbitration and whatnot. So... Well, if it was the same, yes, they would be put in jail. You know, they they would, and obviously we're not going to go around putting anyone in jail, right? So, mm -hmm. but instead, of the way the incentive not to do it and the sort of punishment if you do is the reputation system. That's the whole backbone of the system. So, instead of going to jail, your reputation that permits you to do all other contracts, etc. You know, form companies, uh, get married, whatever it may be, titles, etc you know, it gets, gets damaged, so it will prevent you from doing like all other things. So what we're doing is we're setting a precedent for a reputation-based economy in, in a very deep type of way, right? Oh, yeah. So it's, yeah. It's, it's quite socially interesting as an experiment. Yeah, I mean, I, I see it's already in, in place, that kind, of, um, that kind of system, like in eBay or, you know, in... Um who else uses like Craigslist? I think you know the vendors. They have rating systems for each vendor, right? Um, and people, yeah. everybody researches the vendor before they actually buy the product, right? You know, nobody just picks it random from a <laughs> from a list. <laughs> you know, everybody wants to have uh, a vendor that has good experience, right? Has positive reviews and right things like that. So um, yeah, and even places like Airbnb and uh, you know, I mean, there are the same sort of reviews for like hotels and restaurants and uh, yeah internet really facilitates that so much yeah I think I think a lot of people um, they easily disregard how much anarchy is really already in their lives you know we um, <clears throat> you know we, we, we think that government like has complete control like over every single aspect of our lives whereas they most of the time do not you know like we we, you know, you can you can go a good a good amount of time without actually seeing, uh, you know, getting in contact with government, like you know, at the DMV or you know, by mm -hmm. a, by a police officer or or tax man, you know, and and that whole time that you aren't in contact, that you're essentially living in anarchy, <laughs> right? You know, <laughs> what you want to do that day, what you want to eat, you know, who you want to hang out with, right? You know, that's all your choices, right? That's anarchy. That's basically what it is. Exactly. People are like, anarchy is chaos. No, I'm like, no. Yeah. Anarchy is order. I mean, anarchy is just voluntary decisions. Like, yeah, what are we going to have for dinner? Voluntary agreements. No violence involved. Mm -hmm. Government is chaos because that means violence. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, if, uh, you know, if, if, the, if a certain businessman were to do... Um, you know, he's, he's he's performing the transactions he's performing because they are the most efficient and cost-effective and convenient ways to do business, right? Whereas when a when a when a regulation gets put in place and he's forced to do something else, he's doing something that's unnatural and artificial because there's guns pointed at his head, right? <laughs> or at his business. Yeah, uh, Jeffrey Tucker he said like he had this beautiful statement saying like anarchy is all around us, like every day. I, he, that, uh, there was this beautiful meme. I'll post it and yeah, afterwards. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah, I did see that. Yeah, he, uh, yeah, he's great. I, lo I love him. I saw, I saw him speak in um, Liberty Fest in Brooklyn um, last year. It was pretty cool. The first time I saw him in person. Awesome guy. <laughs> had his, yeah. He had his nice uh, hat on. <laughs> he, looked, he, looked, he looked, he looked like a gangster from the, uh, you know, from the nineteen twenties with, <laughs> with, with the pinstripes and everything. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> he's a very um how you say um you know distinguished guy you know very eloquent speaker as well um, yes yeah i really think that's the best way to spread liberty you know his way like yeah uh, i just he just points to all the positive stuff right that he makes people happy and think like you know uh 
it's like when they said, oh, the, the airport broke down and all the strangers were like put together and it was like perfectly peaceful. This is like voluntary organization, you know, it works and it's beautiful type of thing. That is like great messages, right? Rather than the like, oh, I hate the government. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and the, and the unfortunate thing is um, people are so um, emotionally entwined with, um, you know, with their own government that they, they, um, they conclude that when you are attacking government, they feel that it's a personal attack on them, right? <laughs> because they feel that they are government, right? Or, or, or they have a, like, you know, Uncle Sam, right? He's just my uncle. He's, he's family. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you're attacking my uncle <laughs> you know but uh you know you have, people have to realize that no it's not it's not um your uncle he's not your friend he's not your family he's your master basically <laughs> and he tells yeah. you what to do right <laughs> but i think i mean there must be most people i mean everybody must have like a family member or close friends who work in the government right oh yeah i do if, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, because, yeah, I know, I mean, thousands of people who work in the government, obviously, but, yeah. I mean, because if you think about it, I mean, from, like, school teachers who are often, like, employed by the government to, you know, at least in Sweden, uh, like, obviously, policemen, like, male men, you know, uh, like, I don't know what the percentage of people who work for the government is in the US, but I think in Sweden it's something to, like, you know, 25, 30 percent of the population. That's a good amount. <laughs> That's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In, in Libya, it was, uh, during the Gaddafi regime, it was something that really astonishing, like 97 percent. Hmm. That much? Really? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and also, I said, so what was your job? You know, they were like, oh, I worked at, uh, you know, uh, the ministry of something, you know, and I'm like, but what did you do, like, every day? Yeah. You know? <laughs> they are like, well, I came in once a week, I sent a couple of papers for three hours, and then I left. Mm. And they got, like, a, you know, full-time salary for that. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing how, uh, you know, when uh, jobs are created by force, um, <laughs> you know, how, how easily they justify their existence, right? Uh, I, think, I think it was Milton Friedman, he said... Uh, there's nothing more permanent than a temporary government um, policy. <laughs> uh, exactly, I know, right? <laughs> right. So, so you know, you know, we we created, I think, the um, the CIA as a result of the Cold War, and they say, you know, it's just going to be for temporary. You know, it's just temporary. <laughs> 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 All right. And the, you know, the, what what else uh, is? I think there is. Um, like, like like you know when Nixon delinked the, the 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 dollar from gold from the Bretton Woods system 1971 right again it's just temporary <laughs> 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 right so uh you know that's the nature of government right always to swell and expand at the expense of the industrious right the hard working class always and that is right and i don't think you know i fought for like the longest time uh, I mean, most of my life until just very recently, that the best way to change things was to change it from the inside. Uh, until like Bitcoin came along, and I realized now you can just create something brand new. Oh yeah, and, right. and outcompete it. You know. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's really really cool. Yeah, and, and I love how bit about Bitcoin about how it's decentralized and and uh, <laughs> I think I heard Jeff Berwick say one time I read it somewhere that that they tried to like shut down Bitcoin by like attacking some physical location and they they destroyed you know the computers or, or maybe what? They, yeah, yeah I, I don't know if it was Bitcoin maybe there's something else they just destroyed the computers and then the guys are just looking at these government agents who are destroying the computers and they're like haven't you ever heard of the cloud? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> you know, like like the amount of uh, ineptitude and uh, stupidity that that you know government agents have is overwhelming. You know, we we have to realize how how um, these people are just they're basically just dinosaurs. You know, they're living in the past. Ah, I mean, it's like the Silk Road trial. You know, they are like, oh, we took away the Silk Road, like we put the game prison. Like, I mean, how long did it take? Like forty-eight hours before Silk Road Two was operating? Exactly. Like, <laughs> exactly. It's like it's like it's like whack a mole. You know, you, 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 yeah. right? <laughs> I know. It's so sad. They never and they, you know, they uh, 
they they never learn, you know. Constantly salute, constantly think that uh, you know violence will bring about a peaceful society, right? That's the whole idea of the war on terror, right? Right? You know, yeah. we're going to violently bring you peace and freedom. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I'm gonna fuck to make you a virgin, you know? Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> it's uh it's a losing battle. But uh, I don't, don't want to keep you too long. So um so why don't you um finish up giving any uh last messages or, or websites that you want to um you know let the readers know about you how to contact you? Yeah, please uh, visit BitNation, uh bitnation.co uh not com C O um we have our crowd sale on until uh the end of the month until january 31st and um the white paper and the dev plan and everything is open for input uh, community input until then so we want community input so please check it out and comment you know and um yeah great great thank you for having me on and uh you know, please. <laughs> you wanna, why don't you give the listeners a, a, a parting message? Some, a parting message, yeah. Some, some, what would you say to, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, like, like the, the, the quickest, um, you know, introduction to volunteerism or anarchy? How, how would you, <laughs> like, what would you tell people to think, you know? If you want to, if you want to um, expand or or destroy statism in your life, <laughs> you know, <laughs> w w what would you say is the simplest way, the simplest message you would give? Um, why would you choose just one service provider that's going to uh, force their services on you for violence rather than choosing between millions of voluntary alternatives that you can purchase as quickly as, and as easily as you purchase a new cell phone or shoes or you know food or whatever like why why would government services be any different than, than everything else that you voluntarily choose to purchase or not purchase in your life I, I give one answer because if the USPS doesn't have a monopoly over delivering pieces of paper nobody will ever deliver pieces, <laughs> of, pieces of paper that's why <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they are the only ones in the world who have that capability. Yeah, <laughs> and, and and not only that, but at a sixteen billion dollar debt, <laughs> the only one that can do that, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> nice. Well, very good uh, speaking with you, Suzanne. Thank you very much for the conversation. Uh, so this is um, Peace for Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network uh, and the Conscious Resistance YouTube channel and Conscious Resistance Network. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye.